Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 272, featuring the second installment of my interview with Miss Susan Manley of Old School. In this part of the interview, we talk about the old uh, Koala Pad and what it was like uh, doing graphics with that system. Uh, we also talk about her time at uh, SSI and Electronic Arts. A lot of great stuff in this interview, so without further ado, here is Miss Susan Manley. So I guess at this store it must have been where you encounter this koala, koala, koala pad, koala pad on the little artistic uh, device, right? Yeah, the koala pad was one of the first home tablet devices. They had developed it for the Apple, and they were they made a version that ran on the C sixty four, and uh, it was a touch tablet, and they had a product that was a dancing bear that they shipped with it, but they also had this really cool drawing package and the gentlemen that were um, developing this came in and asked me a whole bunch of questions and with my art background I was having a really good time so they said look you know we'd like to leave a copy of this with you and have you demonstrate it to people and ask what they think and so I did I, I was one of their first focus test sites that was pretty interesting um, because of that I became an expert expert with the koala pad and that actually became instrumental later on in my career when I started making C64 games. One of the reasons I got hired at SSI was because I was an expert with the koala pad. Wow. Yeah, I was taking a look at some of the software for that. It looks very pretty cool. I mean, pretty intuitive. I just yeah. looking at the little screen, I, I could almost imagine, well, I, I could see how that would work. It's actually far more intuitive than the software now. <laughs> oh, I, I don't doubt that. I'm trying to use a Photoshop sometimes just yeah, I, I w I'm still a big fan of Deluxe Paint. Oh, yeah, me too. Well, let's see. So you went back to school after sometime around in here, right, after you got the, yep. the pad and you wanted to study computer graphics. You see, this was just unheard of at the time. So were there, there weren't they, any computer graphics programs or anything? No, like? there was I was over at the local JC, which is De Anza College, which at the time was considered the second best junior college in the state of California. Um and they had no computer graphics programs. They hadn't even thought about it. They didn't really have a computer lab like that either. It didn't exist. Um, we're still using those printing terminals. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I never even actually went in their computer lab. But uh, they, uh, I started taking computer science classes and graphic arts classes. And um, I was using my computer at home <laughs> for homework. <laughs> But uh, I probably knew more than most of the people that were in there. Um, the people that were teaching the classes had only really used uh, computing at the high end. So the, the great big IBM uh, workstations for business. And most of them were not home computer users. And so it was an interesting thing. You know, we were getting lectures on how hard disks worked and they were showing us the great big platters and whatnot. <laughs> You actually helped to shape that curriculum after a while, right? Yeah, I, I actually, well, I I influenced what they ended up doing um, by marrying the two and talking to my both my teachers on both sides about what I was trying to do. Um, I didn't actually graduate the, with a degree because I ended up getting hired. <laughs> yeah, so you say you were recruited by SSI, so did they have they heard about you and showed up, or how did that work out? Actually, um, I had worked with a gentleman by the name of Tom Wall, who was the um, manager of the art department at SSI, and they had just landed the deal to do the AD&D products. Um, they had paid a million dollars for the license to TSR, and they were absolutely intent on making this great big epic product, and of course... I had a couple of things really going for me. And Tom knew that I had was in school for computer graphic arts through another friend. 
And he called me up and he said, hey, you know, I have this going on. And I said, oh, I actually have all my AD&D manuals. I play. He's like, no way. I'm like, way. <laughs> so he, uh, he called me up for an interview and we talked and we talked through all of the various things that they were going to need to do. And they didn't really have the process down yet. They had some very basic ideas of what they wanted to do, but uh, they decided to hire me to do the portraits of the different characters, um, the special scenes and whatnot, and everything that was being done in the koala pad. So oh, yeah, that's one of my favorite. I love those gold box games. I've played them all. I I watched the Matt Chat inter- or introduction where you talked about that, and it, it made me laugh because I get I get talked to about that a lot you know and when you're working on those things you don't really realize how you know groundbreaking they are it's oh, yeah, just fantastic this. stuff i mean <laughs> to me those were the first time i really felt like i was playing ad and d in a computerized form you know this really just really nailed it and i think the artwork contributed a lot to that so you did the portraits uh, what about the environments and the you do with the creatures and everything or what else um, I did some of the creatures. Um, I was one of the people that was abdamnant. Since we had paid for the license, I wanted to make sure that we actually used the characters out of the A and D manual. So we actually scanned some of the artwork in and colorized it or slightly re- redrew it um, because we wanted the, them to be exact. So the people, you know, had a one to one match and knew exactly what it was that they were facing. They wouldn't have to go read the text. If you were familiar with D and D, you know you knew what that was. Yeah, um, I remember the you know, you're talking about doing the character portraits. So, was there any talk at the at SSI about the fact that you could mix the male and female bodies and heads together? <laughs> was that just an accident, or was that intentional, or what? You know what? I didn't know that you could until you just told me. <laughs> um, I think that's actually pretty funny. Uh, those. Portraits were originally drawn by another famous computer game maker, um, Maurice Molyneux, actually drew those, um, and we uh, scanned them in and colored them in, um, and I was responsible for the heads and bodies and making sure that they matched up, but they were supposed to match up to specific heads only on specific bodies. I think that the engineering team just got a little crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I saw somebody was claiming that's the first uh, transgender... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, role-playing game for computers, I guess. All right, so you get, you told me a really funny pool of radiance story. I don't want to spoil the the punchline here, so I'll just uh, let let you talk about this. Oh, the pool my, of radiance. My awesome pool of radiance story. <laughs> um, I worked on all of the different versions of pool of radiance. So I worked on it originally on the C sixty four, and we upresed the art for the IBM PC, and we also put it across to the Amiga and to the Apple. Anyhow, um, as I was busy up everything for the IBM PC, um, we had actually animated the end game scene for Pool of Radiance. And um, I had actually just gotten a copy of Deluxe Paint, by the way, animation. Um, my uh, boyfriend at the time was the assistant producer at Electronic Arts, and, and I was beta testing for them. <laughs> so I was actually able to walk things through animation. Anyhow, um, here I was working away, up this art, and I was animating this scene, and it was the end scene for the game, and it's a swirling pool of water on an altar in a bowl. And it's flanked by these two big skull candles, and, you know, it was as good as I could get done on the C64 with its limited color palette and um, configuration issues, and I was just colorizing it as much as I could for the IBM PC. Anyhow, the VP of engineering walked up behind me. His name was Chuck Krogel, and Chuck looks over my shoulder, and he looks at what I'm drawing, and he goes, that looks like a toilet. (laughs) (laughs) And I turned around, and I looked at him, and I was like, what? And I looked at what I was drawing, And I started laughing hysterically because the reality is it actually did look like a toilet. And I don't think anybody had noticed that. It had gone all the way through test. The art director had seen it. The designers had seen it. Everybody had seen this piece. It was the final piece in the game. It was the pool of radiance. And it looked like a toilet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't think I'll ever look at that the same way again. (laughs) Well, now, 
now, all these years later, I'd love it if somebody would go capture that screen animation because I would totally love to see it again. I haven't seen it in years. You said you'd seen the uh, Joel Billings interview, right? You, I, I watched a good portion of it, yeah. Do you have any reactions it. to anything he says in there? Is it all, does it seem no. to jive with the your Oh, experience? yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, th- they were busy inventing it as they made it. It was pretty impressive. Um, the guys at SSI, they all played war games every night after work. They were all extreme gamers um, in the hexagonal world. You know, they ruled. They knew all of the different games, all of the different aspects about them. It was pretty fun to be around. Although they were kind of surprised that I wasn't all that interested in playing the games. Um, by the time I got done with my day, I went off and did something else. <laughs> And it's kind of an off the wall question, but you know, since we, you know, since you did work on Curse, Curse of the Azure Bonds, uh-huh. as well too. So there's a, you know, there's some. I've seen a, the issue come up about women, you know, as they're portrayed in these games and their armor, you know, tends oh, to. Oh my gosh. Tends to be more sexy than functional, shall we say? You know what? What are, What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I'll tell you actually a really direct story about this. Okay. Um. There, Tom Wall, um. And I had quite the argument about it because they pretty much wanted everybody to be the chainmail bikini babes, is what we called them. And I said, look, you know, not everybody wants to be the chainmail bikini babes. And they're like, all the guys want that. They don't, you know, and we don't have very many female players. And I said, well, you're not going to have very many female players if you continue to play them like this. You know, functional armor that would actually protect people would be, you know, would play a little bit better. Um but uh, at the time, you'll laugh, Tom and I actually argued whether my chest size was average or not, <laughs> <laughs> which was an embarrassing conversation to have. Um, but yeah, he, he absolutely thought that everybody needed to look like they were stepping out of a Victoria's Secret catalog for, as if they were female. And uh I said, gee, you know, how come all the guys don't have to be super attractive? (laughs) Just the women. (laughs) Yeah, you don't see the guy on Pool of Radiance. You know, maybe he should be wearing a... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They don't look like they're off of romance novel covers, put it that way. Oh, exactly. No, no, they get to be rugged. They get to be individual. They get to all have different costumes. They get to all have different hairstyles, but the women all had to have long, flowing locks and lots of cleavage. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I guess around this time you met uh, John Manley, mm-hmm. who was a, you've already mentioned Deluxe Paint, Deluxe Animation a few times, so you want to, it's kind of interesting to get your take on those as an as an artist who had done a lot of work with these earlier products. Um, I loved using Koala Paint, um, but it wasn't available for the upper systems, and the tablet systems at the time were really expensive. So we were all getting used to drawing, as we called it, with a bar of soap, the mouse, <laughs> with bricks, the, the pixels that were double wide on the C64. Um, and when we got on to drawing on the PC um, originally, and then later on to, we started using the Amiga as the base machines, I actually brought in two Amigas to use at SSI, and they rented them from me. <laughs> um, John was... And I had been dating for about a year at the time, and we became the beta test site for Deluxe Paint, and we would log the bugs for him and talk about the features with him. And he would come in and interview us and talk to us about what we were trying to do with the product. Um, I love Deluxe Paint because it is extremely intuitive. It allowed me to single finger select all sorts of different... uh, Things like uh, the eyedropper or whatever by hitting a certain key on the keyboard and clicking the mouse. And so it just became second nature to use it. And the mice of the time were not very sensitive, but Deluxe Paint really helped gloss that over. Um, And you could zoom in and zoom out and rotate things and do all sorts of stuff and lay down textures as a fill. And it really helped. It really helped make the artwork a lot better. And so we started originating the artwork actually on the Amiga and then transposed it over to the C64 and the IBM and then down to the Apple. The King Tut. Yeah. 
Well, you know, that was a really amazing image. Um, and it showed you how you could make gold out of a whole bunch of other um, pixels uh, sitting next to each other. And we had already perfected some of that on the C64 by getting um, some of the things that look gray on there are actually the C64's pink and blue side by side with each other. Um, it fakes the eye out. Um, and so by doing certain sorts of pointillism on the art, we were able to come up with a whole bunch of colors. Certainly the IBM PC artwork at the time was ugly because it had these 16 very bright colors that were meant to show bar charts for business and not really for games. And so we did a whole bunch of different things to actually tone that down and, and make things look a little more normal. You're talking about the EGA? And the EGA, yeah. well, and, and it all had to go down to... to um, to CGA, the four color, um, purple. Uh, That's probably was your least favorite. To, <laughs> yeah, that was, as it an was artist. Hard. Well, you had to learn how to work to make things shapes show in contrast and, and not just with the color that you really wished you could use. And so it was interesting. Yeah, I think that um, I actually talked to a lot of different artists over the years while I was first working at SSI and they all said you do computer graphics ew and they said and they said well yeah it's kind of a challenge and they they would ask me you know what's the biggest challenge and I said well having a fixed palette is probably the biggest challenge because you just you know you can't have the colors and you can't necessarily put the colors that you want to put right next to each other because on the Apple or on the C64 you had color boundaries because it was all character graphics so a lot of issues around that. And all of a sudden, when we got to Deluxe Paint and we were doing Amiga art, we could have the colors. There were no character boundaries. There were no issues that way. Did you get to meet Andy Warhol by any chance? With the... um, actually, I have not met Andy Warhol. I think he did some uh, Deluxe Paint yeah. promos, right? Yeah. Okay, so where are we here? So somehow, I guess from here, you became... Uh, Electronic electronics electronic arts uh, first ever project manager for internally developed projects. Yes. So this is uh, and I might, might might be a surprise to some people to know that they didn't always have these these projects, right? Or how? Um, the producers would typically manage their own outside projects, and they were not really project managers. They were managing um, by delivery. And when we started doing internally developed projects, they needed to run more intensive scheduling on what was happening when and um, to project out when things would be done, how much they would cost, and also to coordinate between handoffs in the members of the team. And um, at the time, the average team size was probably about four people, two engineers and two artists. And, uh, this was back when Trip, Hop Trip Hawkins was... Uh Yes. The show? Yeah. Trip Hawkins was running the show. I was actually, I, I believe, the last interview that Trip used to do, uh, that Trap, Trip actually did. Trip used to interview everybody that came into the company. Um, and I was the final employee that he actually interviewed coming in. Um, and so that was, actually, I had met Trip prior to that. I had met Trip when I had baked a birthday cake for John Manley and brought it to him. I, John used to do all of these really cool um, videos at Electronic Arts. He was known as the video guy because after hours he did these things. Um, he dressed up the facilities, um, the head of facilities as RoboCop and called her Robo Ruth and a whole bunch of other really cool stuff like that. Anyhow, um, so I baked John this giant videotape birthday cake and took it in, and um, that was how I met Trip. He started asking me about SSI, and it turned out later on that the reason that he was asking me, you know, hey, how's the games? You know, oh, what do you think of the company? Blah 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 blah, was that we were actually in the negotiations to have them distribute our products. I had no idea, and I was extremely evasive to Trip at the time. Oh, the games are cool. I don't know. I don't play games. I played Dumb Blonde. But because <laughs> um, I was afraid to give anything away, we were still in development. So that was you were working on Genesis games, Super Nintendo games, DOS, 
Windows 3.1 and, and CoinOp. I didn't even know EA did CoinOp. EA launched a CoinOp studio. Um, we had some really amazing folks come in. Um, a gentleman that became famous later, uh, Charlie Grisafi, he went on to do Area 51 later. All oh, right, yeah, was, great game. Yeah, Charlie was fantastic. Um, they were trying to do a John Madden football on CoinOp. And actually, we invented some really cool technology while we were doing John Madden football on CoinOp, including um, up until then, they had had to draw numbers and map them onto all of the different players on the, the sports teams. What they invented was a way to have like a digital clock show up on these folks' chests and they could change any of the jerseys into any of the numbers. Um, and the player numbers, you know, matched up with real players in the real world for stats. And so that was one of the things that came out of John Madden football. It was a really cool product. Um, they couldn't quite get the technology that they were going for to, to work with the time for play and the, get the strategy, you know, in a coin op kind of a configuration where it was fast enough to play. Um, so it never quite gelled all the way. I guess you must have worked on the Genesis version of uh, Madden, right? The um, I actually didn't project manage any of the Genesis versions of Madden because we didn't do them internally. I was aware of them. I, I played them, but we didn't do those developments in-house. Um, what were some I, of the big projects that you did work on? Um, I worked on the Road Rash property. Um, both Road Rash 1 and Road Rash 2 on the Sega Genesis and Road Rash 1 on the Super Nintendo. I worked on uh, Jungle Strike, Desert Strike, and Urban Strike. I worked on uh, PGA Tour uh, Windows. Uh, I worked on uh, Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer and later on Navy Fighters. Um, I worked on LHX, which was on the Sega Genesis as well. Um, that was the. I worked on Blockout on the Sega Genesis. I worked on Bard's Tale 4. Um, I worked on 8 million different versions of basketball. I can't tell you all the names anymore. Um, there were a lot of different basketball games. Um, and there was a couple of, of uh, golf games on the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis as well. I was looking at, you know, looking at the Jungle Strike mm -hmm. game, which you know, that's a pretty significant title for right, the that, first that 16 was a, megabit project. And that I was, was looking a, at the sequel too. Was also a big game, right? The According to Wikipedia, anyway, you can verify this, right? But it's looking at it on Wikipedia, and it said it was the highest-selling title at EA at the time. Yep. I, actually, that would be correct. Um, I believe that it sold $80 million, Jungle Strike did. And actually, we were told afterwards that the VP of marketing was sad that, that he, he didn't know how good the product was going to be because he would have supported it with um, t television advertising. Um John and I were both heavily influenced by John Cameron's films at the time with the big epic openings and all sorts of interesting things. And Jungle Strike was the first 16 megabit game that Electronic Arts did. And so using my game store knowledge, I had recommended that he create a really cool opening movie with part of that space. And so we did. Um, we actually wrote the movie in, in the shower one day. <laughs> um, we were trying to figure out... The original uh, Desert Strike was sort of a Gulf War simulation, um, but not an exact one-to-one -one match. And so um, we were trying to build on that storyline, what would happen, you know, if the people from the Gulf War joined up with the rebels down in South America that were doing the drug trade to get back at the U.S. And how would they do that? And so 
we thought, you know, the nuclear threat, of course, you pull the nuclear card. And uh, how would you make people really, really think that this was urgent and they needed to go get involved with it? Well, you have a nuclear bomb go off. And so that's what we designed for the opening movie. And how do you make them really hate the people that did this? Well, you show them killing a bunch of monkeys and, and birds and stuff on this, you know, cute little island. And uh, wow, you know, that was a big thing for the time. Um, nobody did that. And it made a big impact. And we also changed vehicles throughout the game. So it wasn't just a helicopter. You actually flew a stealth bomber. And you had a couple different helicopters. And um, it made for a much more interesting game. And then we did a movie poster, or a, a game poster that looked like a movie poster. It was very much inspired by what was going on out in the movie industry. And uh, that made the product just sell like hotcakes. So it did sort of have a political commentary it, uh, aspect to it, right? <laughs> Thank you. That was me. <laughs> um, basically, the, the whole premise behind Strike was sort of uh, stop the wars before they happen, um, which was you're supposed to get in there and, and stop things before they got too bad. Um, and yeah, kind of looking at all of the dark forces of whatever was going on at the time politically and not being too specific. Um, and we actually, uh, tried to slot in international pilots, by the way, in the games. I don't know if anybody notices that anymore, but we had, you know, Iraqi pilots and Israeli pilots and all sorts of other stuff in our games. We were trying very hard. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should see you uh, guys again next year uh, with the third installment of this interview. Lots of great stuff. I got at least uh, at least at least one, maybe two more, and possibly even three more episodes uh, with Susan. I have to see what uh, that second reel looks like. Uh, but lots of great stuff coming up. I know you guys will enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you very very much. If you have supported this show, really means a lot to me, guys. If you would like to. Uh, Support Matt Chat. Uh, if you want to throw a dollar my way, uh, just go to the Patreon site in the show notes. Very quick, painless uh, set to uh, set that up, and that'll get you access to some uh, audio podcasts. I'm starting a new series, uh, little monologues uh, by your old buddy Matt there. Uh, just look at the Patreon site, and uh, you can if you support the show at any level, you get access to those, as well as the uh, Google Hangouts and, and much, much more. It's uh, well worth it. Uh, plus, you'll be supporting the show, so thank you very much. Okay, let's see. What about the news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> well, uh, we got a little Christmas-related stuff coming up, but just to get some uh, some weird stuff, I noticed on uh, on uh, Kickstarter <laughs> today, <laughs> there's a scratch and sniff gaming card system. It's uh, a Canadian guy named Jeremiah is apparently setting this up. And he, he mentions a game called Earthbound for the, I guess that was for the Super Nintendo. You know, consoles aren't, aren't really my thing, but apparently they had this scratch and sniff card. It seems like a Infocom, one of the Infocom games, I believe. I'm pretty sure, yeah, uh, they had a scratch and sniff. Uh, what was that? Anyway, <laughs> you guys probably know. Uh, but anyway, this is kind of a cool idea. He's trying to, I think, raise a $10,000 uh dollars or whatever they have in canada for this so i thought i'd uh, pass that along kind of a, kind of an interesting thing scratch and sniff gaming and he had some pretty good examples of, of of it too he was talking about how in uh in a game like dragon age maybe you're walking through some flowers and then it would tell you to uh, <laughs> sniff uh, a certain part of a card so you could smell the uh, the flowers uh, pretty cool uh, also uh, this will be of interest to you uh amiga fans uh, Chris, oh, like I never know, I never know how to pronounce this guy's name. Looks like Holsbeck, maybe. Uh, Chris Holsbeck, he's got a piano collection and score book uh, up on Kickstarter, and this it looks really slick. And you can listen to some of the uh, piano versions of his uh, songs. Of course, uh, he's he's done the Turrican soundtrack, R Type, uh, great uh, Gianna Sisters, some of my favorite uh, soundtracks. Really, he's a <laughs> kind of the man. For, when it comes to the Amiga soundtracks. But anyway, I thought you guys would like to look at that. It looks like a really nice uh, collection that he's put together. All right, uh, now 
uh, Christmas stuff, uh, a couple of uh, gifts I wanted to mention. Uh, a couple Steam uh, gifts. Uh, Becca sent me a game called Hero Siege and Indie Hack and Slash. It looks pretty interesting. Uh, and let's see. Uh, Rid Cully sent me a game called Dominions 4. It says Happy Holidays and Turn Based Strategies, Dungeon Crawling, and Adventure Ridden 2015. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Rid Cully, for Dominion 4. And then Matt. I believe this is Huston or Houston, not really sure. Matt Huston, looks like Huston. Uh, sent, <laughs> sent a really funny looking game called Corporate Lifestyle Simulator. So I have to admit I've been so swept up. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play any of these, but uh, you know, thank you very much though. I'm really looking forward to uh, trying them out. And I'll let you know what I think. Okay, what else? Oh, uh, uh, Shane Stacks. I sent this really awesome calendar here. Got a, <laughs> it's all about rats. <laughs> and the, woo, you get a little too excited about the rat calendar here. Get this back. A little Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a calendar with nothing but, you know, my favorite critters on here. Now I notice that these rats, uh, I don't see any of them with a with an axe blow to the head, so I might have to make my own calendar next year. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a pretty thoughtful gift. I'm really impressed with that. Uh, and then, let's see, uh, Roland. Let me make sure I get his name. Uh, hello, Matt. Merry Christmas from Roland. I'm sending you the results of a bit more fun with Blender and Shapeways. I think this is uh, pretty cool. Uh, anyway, uh, you do know what this is. Yes, yes, I know. Oh, uh, but the thing is, uh, this is totally incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> no, the letter's fine, just my trying to uh, interpret it. Anyway, he sent a little ornament that he made. Uh, he even has a nice little bag that goes with it. And uh, there you go. So you can see that. That is the from Wasteland 2, the pistol packing priest Luke Sampson. Uh, so, anyway, that's, that's really cool. I haven't decided yet if I want to, uh, you know, put this, maybe have a necklace with this, or maybe a little Christmas tree ornament. Uh, but anyway, that's that's pretty cool. Very nice, I'm really impressed with that. I mean, this Shapeways would be great for uh, you guys doing Kickstarters if you want to have a little tchotchke with your game like Richard Garriott used to do. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty sweet. All right, uh, what about that ale of the week? Now, this is turning out to be quite the uh, interesting after interview segment. <laughs> All right, so this is the Excelsior Brewing Company. I'm, I, you know, I'm pretty sure I haven't done this one before, so apologies if this is a repetition. I don't think that it is, though, but who knows? There's a lot of uh, ale <laughs> between me and the uh, first episode of Matt Chat. Uh, this is the Bridge Jumper India Pale Ale. 7.5% uh, alcohol, so definitely a respectable uh, strength there. Let's see if they say anything about the... Yeah, here we go. Bridge Jumper India Pale Ale, a multi IPA brewed with a shipload of raw whole hops. It's always been easier to stay in the boat, stand on the shore, or wonder what if. For all those who have allowed their toes to bend over the edge and made the leap, we celebrate you with our inaugural brew. Face life head on and jump in with both feet. That's a nice sentiment there. I don't see, oh, there we go. So brewed and bottled in Excelsior, Minnesota. Oh, so it's Minnesota beer. That's uh, pretty cool. I didn't even know it was a, a local uh, selection. Uh, Excelsior, I'm not really sure where Excelsior is in relation to uh, to St. Cloud. If it's not too far, it would be kind of fun to, to head out there and take a look at the at the brewery. But anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got, all right, so I got some of this uh, bridge jumper here in this rather excellent drinking horn. Been smelling it. You get that definitely get kind of a toasty, malty aroma to this. You can smell the hops in here. Uh, you know, it smells exactly what you would expect a good IPA to smell like. You know, so it smells great. A nice thick uh, head on this, but let's go ahead and uh, give it a try. Mm. That is a really uh, tasty one here. Kind of a marshmallow like flavor. A bit of a little bitterness, like a good coffee. Uh, good black coffee sort of uh, uh, notes there. 
Oh, what else is in there? Maybe a little, uh, little bit of a kind of a chocolatey like taste to it. Just all around a really good uh, selection here. It's, it's definitely a little bit on the bitter side, but I don't know if I'm just in the mood for bitterness right now, but <laughs> uh, that is uh, quite good. Actually, I'm really, really liking this one. Try it uh, one more time here. Yeah, just uh, a really good IPA. If you like something with a lot of flavor and uh, a little bit of bitterness, but not, not too much. Nice, thick, something you can sip on. Uh, you know, for uh, over the course of an evening, I think this would be a very good choice indeed. I'm actually uh, really happy to see this. And, uh, you know, coming right out of Minnesota, I mean, these guys obviously have their act together. Uh, so I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go full five out of five drinking horns on this one. Uh, one of the best IPAs I've had, really. Uh, just really, really, <laughs> this is kind of taking me aback. I would never have guessed uh, this would be this, uh, it would be this good. So see if you can find this. Uh, Bridge Jumper India Pale Ale from the Excelsior Brewing Company. A uh, really good choice. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, uh, Susan had mentioned uh, Cameron, how they were inspired by uh, uh, James Cameron on the uh, Jungle Strike game. So I was looking for quotes from him. He's actually got quite a few uh, good ones to choose from, but uh, the one that I like the best... All right, here it is. The film industry is about saying no to people, and inherently you cannot take no for an answer. See you guys next week. Make love and be merry, for tomorrow you may catch some disgusting skin disease. <laughs>